Hi, this is Pastor McLaren for the Men's Reformed Fellowship, a ministry of First Presbyterian Church in Perkasy, Pennsylvania. Today is November the 8th, I believe, November the 8th, 2018. We are making our way through Dr. R.C. Sproul's book, Essential Truths of the Christian Faith, and we are uh, now moving through the uh, attributes of God, and uh, today we consider the omnipotence of God, how God is all-powerful. So that was the topic for our discussion this morning, and I hope to uh, add to that a little bit here uh, in our video today. Now, last time, uh, as we made our way through Dr. Sproul's book, we looked at the self-existence of God, how God does not owe his existence to his creature, he does not, does not depend upon his creature for anything. He is entirely a free being who is eternally self-existing. And we can understand that in part because he's a trinity of persons, three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They mutually love, encourage, support, and have fellowship with each other. Unitarian concepts of God do not rise up to this level. The Unitarian God, if you will, will likely turn out to be a mad God if you make a comparison with regard to human experience. If you put somebody in solitary confinement, what happens to them? They go mad. They go insane because we are creatures meant for fellowship, meant for community, meant for communication. If that is true of us, if we are separated from others and placed in solitary confinement, what must we say about a Unitarian God who has no one else to speak with uh, in eternity past? Uh, how confident can you be that this God uh, is coherent, is compassionate? Um, what, what confidence can you have that he uh, cares for you? Uh, these are things that uh, assure us once again that God eternally exists as a trinity, and uh, uh, these three persons mutually interact with each other, and as such, God is self-existent. Uh, he is independent of his creation. He does not need us. He does not beg or wait for us to respond to him as offers of grace. No, he is sovereign over all. He is free uh, all to himself, and he acts according to the freeness of his nature. Today we consider the omnipresence, or excuse me, the omnipotence of God, and uh, his, obviously his great power, and uh, that certainly is a reflection of his being as self-existent. He has life within himself, and so he has power within himself as well. He is all-powerful through and through his being. Every aspect of his character is uh, filled with power. And so he is powerful to save, powerful to know and understand all things. He has the power to uh, enforce and impose his will on his creation. He is powerful to fulfill all righteousness. Um, the God that we serve is a God of uh, unlimited power, at least unlimited as we'll begin to explain that in the text before us today. So. Uh, we're going to look at what Dr. Sproul says uh, and uh, I, I think uh, take off a little bit on the final paragraph in the chapter because we don't want you to look at the, omnipres or, excuse me, uh, the, the omnipotence of God in merely an abstract theological way as a, some sort of a concept that we must have about God and we uh, include that in our theological library but it is given for the church for her comfort and encouragement that the God that we serve is an almighty God. And uh, that will make itself plain as we go through this here. But um, we are here to strengthen our relationship with God, deepen our fellowship with Him, increase our confidence in Him, and move us to worship Him for who He is. And so there is to be through these reflections, uh, a sense that we are coming to know God more fully and more perfectly, and uh, uh, removing from our minds 
uh, imperfect or impure or unworthy conceptions of God where we uh, limit his power in, in different ways. So uh, let's get started. Uh, we are on chapter 13, page 39, at least in this edition and earlier edition of uh, Dr. Sproul's book. So Dr. Sproul writes as follows, every theologian is sooner or later asked a question by a student that is posed by, as an impossible nut to crack. I have to think that as Dr. Sproul writes this, he writes out of a lot of experience as he's taught many different students in a classroom type of setting. And no doubt there are these young folks, young men who uh, wanted to test the scholar and see if he could handle some of their objections. And uh, Dr. Sproul was more than up to the task, of course. Um, I think he'll have some important things to say on the subject of God's omnipotence. More could be said, of course. He's just given a summary, a quick, concise statement on the doctrine, uh, but uh, we, we can follow along here. So the old query is this. Can God make a rock so big that he cannot move it? At first glance, this question seems to impale the theologian on the horns of an unsolvable dilemma. If we answer yes, then we are saying that there is something God cannot do. He cannot move the rock. If we answer no, then we are saying that God cannot build such a rock. Either way, we answer Either way we answer, we are forced to place limits on God's power. So can God build a rock that he cannot move? Well, that affects either his ability to create or his ability to act. And one way or the other, um, God is limited on that uh, view of God and that question of God. And we're going to talk about this here in, as we go on. So I'm not going to make much, of a way, much in the way of comments here. He says, this problem resembles the other teaser. What happens when an irresistible force meets an immovable object? We can conceive of an irresistible force. We can likewise conceive of an immovable object. What we cannot conceive of is the coexistence of the two. If an irresistible force ever met an immovable object and the object moved, it could no longer properly be called immovable. If the object did not move, then our irresistible force could no longer properly be called irresistible. We see then that reality cannot contain both an irresistible force and an immovable object. So we are de dealing in the rational realm of theolog or, or the logical uh, issues that uh, come up with regard to the omnipotence of God and uh, apparent contradictions uh, uh, present themselves to us. Sproul continues, Meanwhile, back to the immovable rock, the dilemma posed here, as in the case of the irresistible force, is a false dilemma. It is false because it is erected on a false premise. It assumes that omnipotence means that God can do anything. Yet, as a theological term, omnipotence does not mean that God can do anything. The Bible indicates several things that God cannot do. He cannot lie, Hebrews 6.18. He cannot die. He cannot be eternal and created. He cannot act against his nature. He cannot be God and not be God at the same time and in the same sense. So here's where we begin to develop an answer to these uh, perplexities with regard to the omnipotence of God. Uh, the, these apparent dilemmas that are presented to us uh, are false dilemmas. Uh, they present a, a situation that uh, does not reflect reality. In fact, when you think of the fact that God cannot do something, like he cannot lie, for example, that indicates not a weakness of God or an inability so much as a strength. God does not succumb to lying. Uh, he uh, overcomes that with truth. 
he is fully truthful. And so the fact that God cannot lie is not a weakness in God by any means. Rather, it's a reflection of his strength and great power. He is fully and faithfully committed to truth. He is truth, as we'll learn later. And so uh, you have a false dilemma presented in these uh, logical um, uh, statements. Uh, an immovable force, what happens when an immovable force meets an irresistible, um, excuse me, an immovable object meets an irresistible force. And so it's a false dilemma because God is one who cannot create something which is greater than himself. Uh, that is not a weakness. It's just stating the truth that there's only one all-sufficient, all-powerful God, the creator. And he cannot create another God. An immovable object uh, obtains the quality of infinity. Uh, it, it, it cannot be moved. It is unlimited in its power to remain in one position. And that is an aspect of deity, uh, this infinity. Well, God, first of all, uh, God cannot be created. Otherwise, he's not God. He's a creature. And uh, so God cannot create a, an object, a stone that's too great for him to, to move and all these kinds of things. So we are presented with false dilemmas, which uh, we can reject. Uh, what omnipotence does, does mean is that God holds all power over his creation. No part of creation stands outside the scope of his sovereign control. Therefore, there is a correct answer to the dilemma of the rock. The nut can be cracked. The answer is no. God cannot build a rock so big that he could never move it. Why? If God ever built such a rock, he would be creating something over which he has no power. He would be destroying his own omnipotence. God cannot stop being God. He cannot not be omnipotent. Um, so God, being all-powerful, cannot create something that would limit his power um, and, and take away his power, I, I think is the sense of what Dr. Sproul is trying to say here. When the Virgin Mary was puzzled by Gabriel's announcement to her of the conception of Jesus in her womb, the angel said to her, For with God nothing will be impossible. Luke 1 verse 37. Here the angel was reminding Mary of God's omnipotence. I guess even angels are capable of using hyperbole. Narrowly considered, the angel expressed bad theology. But the broader biblical understanding points to the meaning that God's power reaches far beyond that of the creature. What may be impossible for us is possible with him. To say that nothing is impossible with God means that he can do whatever he wills to do. His power is not limited by finite limitations. Nothing or no thing can restrict his power. Yet his power is still restricted by what and who he is. Sin is impossible for him because one cannot sin without willing to sin. God cannot commit sin because he never wills it. Job got to the heart of this matter when he said, I know that you can do everything and that no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. Uh, I don't know that Dr. Sproul is perhaps describing it the best way, in the best way, uh, the Ga angel Gabriel's uh, comment to Mary, nothing will be impossible for God. Um, it, it needs to be, whenever you come to a statement of scripture, which we've considered before, which raises questions, you need to always understand it in the context of all that God has to say. You cannot just simply take a statement in the abstract, take it apart, and then say, you see, this is saying X, Y, and Z. With God, all things are possible. Well, then if you take it in the abstract, apart from the rest of the revelation of Scripture about God and his character, if you take it in the abstract, 
then you, you can say, well, God can do anything. Well, then God can lie. God can murder. God can uh, create a stone bigger than what he can move. All these kinds of things. Um, clearly, that's not what the angel Gabriel was saying. You need to understand him in the light of the whole history of God's revelation. And so when he is saying that with God, nothing is impossible, um, he's saying to Mary uh, that in terms of the conception of a child without the benefit of a human father, uh, this is not impossible for God. God is able to uh, conceive this child within her. And so the Holy Spirit overshadows her and not in a way which the ancient Greeks described as um, God, Zeus, having relationships with uh earthly women and conceiving children through them. That's not the biblical conception. The Holy Spirit overshadows Mary and creates within her womb a new child, uh, a son, uh, Jesus Christ. So it's completely uh, different from pagan conceptions of God's mating with uh, mankind and that sort of thing. So we take what, what Gabriel said here in, in the broader context of Scripture, which again is something we must always do whenever we are reading God's Word. Okay, here's the last paragraph of the chapter. For the Christian, God's omnipotence is a great source of comfort. We know that the same power God displayed in creating the universe is at his disposal to assure our salvation. He showed that power in the exodus from Egypt. He displayed his power over death in the resurrection of Christ. We know that no part of creation can frustrate his plans for the future. There are no maverick molecules loose in the universe that could possibly disrupt his plans. Though powers and forces of this world threaten to undo, we have no fear. We can rest in the knowledge that nothing can withstand the power of God. He is the one who is almighty. And so with that, we uh, pause for a moment to think about the, the work of God's power uh, in our world today. And we know that this power of God is evident in the work of creation. God speaks and it, within the space of six days, everything is created. Here is a great work of power bringing into existence that which did not have existence. Um, the prophet Isaiah reflects on God's great power and how he uh, created the heavens and the earth. And uh, in the 40th chapter, he says this, To whom will you compare me? Uh, God speaking through Isaiah. Or who is my equal, says the Holy One? Lift your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created these? He who brings out the starry host one by one and calls them each by name. Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. And so when you look at the heavens and see the great stars above, when you uh, look through uh, the Hubble telescope and all the various wonderful images of the heavens that we uh, see there and take a look at supernovas and all kinds of things that happen within our galaxy or within uh, solar systems ab above us. Um, we see the great power of God first in the creation of all these things and secondly in sustaining them, holding everything in place. Why is it they don't just run into each other, collapse and blow up and everything fall apart? It's because God by his power is sustaining the world which he created. By his providence, he governs all things, and his power is at work in that way, governing the heavens above us and governing as well the things that occur on the earth. Uh, God rules over all in terms of the course of history and time, and he's committed that uh, rule to his son, the Lord Jesus, uh, particularly upon his death and resurrection. Um, he, he rules over the course of history today. We read in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3 and following, uh, that the Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. And so the Son, existing in heaven in glory with the Father, 
Uh, the Son, the Christ, the mediator, Jesus, rules from heaven over the course of history and sustains by all things, sustains all things by his powerful word. So his word speaks and is accompanied with power. And it accomplishes, as Isaiah speaks of in Isaiah 55, his word goes forth and accomplishes every purpose that God has for that word. It is powerful. And you might remember that the Apostle Paul takes that conception uh, in his understanding of the gospel message as he goes from one community to the next. And uh, he engages in what he elsewhere calls the foolishness of the gospel and the weakness of, uh, of this gospel message of a Christ who was crucified. Here there are emblems of weakness and the, the death of the mediator Jesus on the cross at the hands of hostile uh, uh, Jews and, and Romans. Uh, a, a very evident sign of weakness there. And then Paul being himself one of no great eloquence, uh, no great personal power, not a, if you will, a charismatic figure uh, attracting great attention to him. Uh, he says, through the foolishness of the preaching of the word, um, he, he, he has great confidence in the effect of that word. Why? Because as he says in Romans chapter 1, for uh, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God to salvation for all who believe, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And so the, the gospel that, that we preach today is accompanied with the great power of God to accomplish the purpose for which this gospel is sent, the redemption of the elect. And so when that gospel is preached, it accomplishes its purpose one way or the other, hardening some in their sin and, con and setting them over for condemnation uh, or bringing life to the elect, enabling them to receive the gospel, trust in Christ, and live a new life. And so you recall uh, years ago when Abraham uh, was approaching 100 years of age and his wife Sarah was 90 years of age, God promised that they would have a child. Well, uh, Sarah laughed at this and, you know, it, it was considered an amazing thing. Can God do such a thing? Well, the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 4 speaks about this event and he says that Abraham believed in God, that God could bring from, the, from what was dead, bring new life. And indeed, God would uh, conceive a child in Sarah through her union with Abraham. And so in this womb, as good as dead, God produced the life of a child. And it's this great power of God to produce life, evident in Sarah and, and, and strengthening her to bear Isaac, her child, and in Mary to give birth to the Christ uh, without the help of a man, uh, and, and Christ being born of a virgin. Uh, this great power is the power of God that comes to give us new birth. When God sends his spirit in, into our hearts and uh, brings new life to we who were spiritually dead in trespasses and sins. We were dead and unable to live for God, serve God, or do anything for God. And so just as it was impossible for uh, uh, Abraham and Sarah to conceive, bear, and give birth to a child, and just as, as it was impossible for the virgin Mary to conceive a child without the help of a man, though she was young enough certainly to bear a child, uh, God is able to do that same great powerful thing in us, causing us to be born again by his great and powerful word. Well, why is this? It's because that we are united to Jesus Christ in his great resurrection from the dead. Here is another situation which is impossible in human terms. How can it be that one would rise from the dead? If I function out of the materialistic worldview of the scientists and uh, worldly philosophers of our day, then certainly when you look at all things from the uniformity of natural causes based on my own sense experience and try to evaluate things based on what I can measure and observe, then yes, it is impossible for one to rise from the dead bodily and to live a new life. Uh, at best, the scientist might say, well, th there could be a quirk, some accidental thing that reverses the process and someone comes back to life. We see people who die for a 
a brief little bit, maybe uh, a minute or two, at least in terms of what we are able to perceive medically, and then they come back to life in that way. But for somebody to be dead for three days and rise from the dead, that's not something that we observe. That's not something that we believe is possible. And indeed, uh, humanly speaking, it is impossible. But God is not a human. God is God. And he is able to uh, bring that body back again from the dead. Uh, Jesus was raised on the third day. And we go back to Romans chapter 1 again. Paul will make this uh, very significant statement about uh, Jesus' resurrection. I want to get the, the correct words here for you. So, uh, In speaking of Jesus, he says that the, the gospel is regarding his son, who as to his human nature was a descendant of David. This is Romans 1 verse 3 and into now verse 4. And who through the spirit of holiness was declared with power to be the son of God by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. And so by the spirit's work in Jesus, uh, he rose from the dead with great power and entered into power, the power of the ascended Lord. And so now we who are believers in the Lord Jesus have this great resurrection power at work within us. We are united to Christ both in his death as he died for us, but also in his resurrection as he lives for us and for our benefit. And so because we are united to Christ in both his death and his resurrection, we are enabled to live a new life. I think quite often in our Christian preaching, we focus on the cross, which is indeed central to our faith, but we tend to neglect our union with Christ in his resurrection. And that's certainly alien to the theology of the Apostle Paul, who not only notes our union with Christ in his death, he died for us, I am crucified with Christ, Paul says, but also we are united to Christ in his resurrection. And this resurrection is a resurrection of power. Uh, you might recall that Paul says in Ephesians chapter 1, uh, in his prayer for the, the saints there in Ephesus, um, he speaks of this great work of God's resurrection power at work in us. He says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and his in incomparably great power for us who believe. Here's that great power of God at work, and he's going to unite it to the resurrection of Christ. That power is like the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every title that can be given, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come, uh, and so forth. So here, Paul prays that we who are believers, who are born again by the power of God, who are joined to Christ in his resurrection, might have that power at work within our lives daily, on a daily basis, that we might live by the power of this great God. And it's rather significant that Paul uh, gives us a prayer request about us having power. He, he roots it not in God's work of creation of the heavens and the earth, which would clearly be a, a, an appropriate thing. God, who created the heavens and the earth, can surely give us power to do what we need to do for each day. But he roots it in the power of the resurrection of Christ. And I think because as great as the, the creation is, this, this resurrection of Christ from the dead is even more powerful because it's part of the new creation, the new heavens and the new earth. If any man is in Christ, he is a new creation, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5. So this great new power of the resurrection is at work within us. Um, I think of what Paul had to say in uh, Philippians chapter 3, when he speaks again about his union with Christ and his fellowship with him. Um, he says in verse 8, What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. Now this is the verse I wanted to get to. I'm sorry for 
taking a little bit here. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of, his, of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. This is part of the Christian experience in his life in this age. We live by the power of the resurrection of Christ, that power that raised him from the dead bodily, that uh, raised him to the heavens and seated him at the right hand of God, that gave him authority over the heavens and the earth, as he said uh, to his disciples, all authority, all power is given to me in heaven and on earth. Uh, this great power is the power that uh, is at work within us who are redeemed of the Lord. And certainly it is connected with great weakness as we struggle in life, as we face many difficulties and, and trials. And uh, in many respects, there's great weakness in, in, that is entailed in our human existence. Our bodies are decaying, but hopefully our inner spirit, our inner man is being renewed day by day, as Paul speaks of in 2 Corinthians 5. And so we have this great power at work within us. And finally, it will be revealed in, uh, once more in his great glory as the, the dead are raised on the last day, the righteous are brought to eternal life, there will be a new heavens and a new earth, and we will live forever by the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so what an amazing thing. The great comfort of this is for believers is that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ. God has purposed to save you, and he is powerful to save. He will defend you from your enemies. He will protect you from all harm. He will empower you to overcome temptation so that he will crush Satan under your feet. He will raise you from the dead on the last day. His power is at work within you. You think of what Paul says in Romans chapter 8. Uh, if God be for us, who can be against us? Uh, this is the great uh, comfort and encouragement of the church that in spite of our personal weakness, our frailties, the infirmities of our bodies, uh, the, the uh, affliction and the forces that are opposed to us in this world order as we experience it day by day, nonetheless, God is for us. He who did not withhold his very own son, uh, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? If God be for us, who can be against us? And Paul concludes by talking about even death cannot separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And so we have this great comfort and insurance that our God is almighty. We do not live in a world in which there are two equal forces, God and the devil. And they're battling it out in the course of history. And hopefully God will win out in the end. Uh, no, God is sovereign and powerful, and he rules all of history by his own almighty word. And all things will be accomplished uh, according to his will. So uh, be encouraged. You see, this understanding of the omnipotence of God uh, might seem to be something that uh, gets us debating various rational things, various logical dilemmas and these kinds of things. But in the end, it is of great comfort to the church and tells us of the great power of God that is at our disposal to help us live for him and to be safely brought into God's eternal kingdom. Well, we'll finish there for today. Uh, thank you so much for watching these videos. Uh, I hear from some of you from time to time. Uh, may God richly bless you as you meditate on God's word. And may we all grow to know Christ our Savior and to know him and the power of his resurrection. This is Pastor McLaren for First Presbyterian Church in Perkesee, Pennsylvania. Our church meets on the corner of Fifth and Race Streets, and our services begin at 9.30 each Sunday morning. Please join us and uh, help us to serve God together. We look forward to seeing you at some point. God bless. Take care.